Uh, it's good to be with you again this morning. And uh, we're going to move away from the purpose of the church. Um, but in actual fact, a supernatural church is still very much the purpose of the church. And over the next couple of weeks, what I'm wanting to do is just to draw our attention to what the scripture says about how it is that we should be representing heaven. We are a supernatural church. Um, if you think of it, God kind of operates outside of the natural. I mean, he is supernatural. And he would call us to trust to him, trust him to be able to work through us what it is that he wants us to enjoy. And it is about just being a supernatural community. And so that's what I'm going to be looking at over the next couple of weeks. So I do encourage you to, to join us for this particular series. Um, my name is Ashley Bell. I lead the team that leads this particular campus known as New Covenant Church Bryanston. And uh, it's wonderful that you've been able to join us this morning. Now, one of the things that we've done over the years is that we've decided, you know what, we do need to have a mission statement. And I guess that's one of the things that you do when you plant a church is you decide we need a mission statement. The people have to know what it is that we're about. And so one of the things that we've arrived at is simply saying that we're a loving community of people who stand firm in the truth over time against raging currents of opposition and who present living proof of a living God to a watching world. That's why I'm preaching on being a supernatural church because a living God, as we know, is a supernatural God. And of course, what we have to do is make sure that we're representing him well. And so there has to be place in our Christianity to embrace the supernatural. If we were just without the supernatural, well, then we would just be simply a social society that just kind of gets together and has a, a great community expression, but nothing of the power of God that we read in scriptures would then be lived through us or experienced by us. And certainly we wouldn't be able to be a loving community of people who stand firm in the truth over time if it wasn't that we had access to the very power that God wants us to enjoy. And so for me, in summary, if I could just say in one line, what is it that we're about? Well, we need to demonstrate the nature and the ministry of Jesus. And so if I go back to any one of those, a loving community, well, that demonstrates the nature and the ministry of Jesus. If we stand firm in truth over time, well, that demonstrates the ministry and nature of Jesus. If we stand firm against the raging currents, all of the, the worldviews are so prevalent today, all of the opposition against the church and the opposition against truth. You know what fascinates me? And in fact, it disturbs me more than fascinates me is the fact that a lie has now become the truth. You know, people speak about, well, that's your truth. In other words, each one of us has the option of being able to choose what our truth is. In other words, truth is now relative. And the tragedy of that is that actually that's not how it is. Truth by its very inherent nature and definition means that it's absolute. And so there's no relative truth. <laughs> Anything that's relative truth is a distortion of the real thing. So it becomes then simply a counterfeit. And there's so much counterfeit out, out there. And that's why the church needs to settle in its heart that we need to really bring truth and not be scared of truth. Currents of opposition. It rages against truth today. And that's why we need to experience and to live out the ministry, demonstrate the nature of Jesus, which was simply to present living proof of a living God to this watching world. And so having said that, you know, even when we spoke about the purpose of the church and I listed those five entities, prayer and worship uh, as one entity, discipling, power, serving, fellowship, it all has to express at heart a demonstration and the nature of the ministry of Jesus. Why would we pray? Why would we worship? Why would we disciple people? Why would we ask God for power, supernatural power? Why don't we want a powerless Christianity? Why do we want to serve? Why do we want to fellowship with one another? All of that is demonstrated in the very nature and ministry of Jesus. And so Jesus is always going to be central to what we embrace and what it is that we believe. <clears throat> now, I'm going to interject this moment um, Mill Thompson, who's one of the uh, daughters in the church, I, I love to call her that because she has been one of the founding members of this congregation and we've been going for as long as we have in excess of 40 years. And her and her husband, Ian, were right here from the very beginning. And over the years, we've grown to respect Mill Thompson. And uh, not only is she a very accomplished musician, a harpist, but also we know her to carry a wonderful mantle of the prophetic upon her. And so she recently, in a week or so ago, she uh, sent me a text, a voice note, simply reminding me of a prophetic word that she gave to me 20 years ago. 
when I, Nadine and I came into transition the leadership from Ian and Nola. And uh, the word that she gave to me came out of 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 19 to 21. And so <clears throat> I'm not going to read it to you. I'm just going to listen to Mill. Now, look, it's a personal word to myself. And so to a degree, I am being vulnerable here. But at the same time, it's not only a word to me. This is a word to New Covenant Church Bryanston and its future. And that's the reason why I have felt the liberty to include it and to simply say, I'm building the supernatural church that talks around this incredible dynamic that God wants us to enjoy around one of the many prophetic words, but one of the individuals whom we trust, Mill Thompson. She is a, a person that carries or has the mantle of a prophet. And so we, we know her. And so when I mention her name, all of you are going, yeah, tick that box. We all know Mill, a lady of great credibility, a lady of great character. And that's why I'm saying the source from which this comes, we all are able to identify with, or able to say, yes, it's a pure thought source. And so this is what she said. And so here is the word. Morning, Ash. Um, I've just had and finished uh, the Zoom prayer time that we have on a Wednesday morning. And um, I was reminded of a scripture in uh, 2 Kings 2, from verse 19 to 21, um, which I remember um, God gave me that word to share with you when you first um, uh, uh, came across to lead um, New Covenant Church. And I felt that this was God's promise um, for you and for the work that he would, would do. And I just felt to remind you of that. And let me just read it to you quickly. It said, Then the men of the city said to Elisha, Please notice the situation of the city is pleasant, as my Lord sees, but the water is bad and the ground barren. And he said, bring me a new bowl and put salt in it. So they brought it to him. Then he went out to the source of the water, cast it in the salt there and said, thus says the Lord, I have healed this water. From it there shall be no more death or barrenness. So the water remains healed to this day, according to the word of Elisha, which he spoke. And I just feel that this is one of the prophetic promises um, that we, we need to um, follow the, the source and that it will lead us to, I, I just believe, uh, just a wonderful release of both spiritual and physical healing that um, is God's promise to us to embrace and to declare over NCCB. So I thought to just remind you of that and um, very excited for the, uh, the, the work of Holy Spirit um, in our lives and in, 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 the, in um, the believers at NCCB. So. Okay, so now that word comes out of 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 19 to 21. Very powerful. But I have to say, I take note of what has been said there and what this message this morning is about, is about how essential is it for us to be responsible with the words that we get from people who are genuine prophets. And so the content of that word is about Elisha and it's about him kind of moving in the supernatural. And so there's a context where, yes, it's all about a situation where the men in the city said to Elisha, hey, we've got a problem here. The city's great. I mean, really, look at this. But the problem is the water is bad. And so I think generally through most huge cities, there is a river. And Joburg doesn't have that. I mean, you've got the Yixke, but that's not really, that's a stream, you know. We're talking about major rivers that run through big cities. And the problem was that the river that was running through the city at the time was resulting in many miscarriages and barrenness, not only in the animals, but also in the people. And so if you look at that word miscarriage, if you look at the word barrenness in the Hebrew, then what you're going to know is there's connections to the loss of children, which is what a miscarriage is. It's for the robbing of children. Now, for me, I, I look at that and I just think, oh my goodness, if I look back over the last 20 years, if I look back over the last 40 years, how many people have come into the life of this church, given their lives to Jesus, but they're not serving him anymore? There's been a miscarriage. There's been just a, can I just say, a stunting of their growth. Why? Because either they were soil that the seed fell on, but they were hard ground. 
But I look at this and I just think, what is, what is God saying to us today? Is it that we should be going back after those people? Should we be praying for those prodigals? And then he says, all right, this is the miracle. He says, bring me a new bowl. I love that word new. Because new means simply fresh. And the Hebrew rendering of that word carries with it the meaning of, all right, force and action. Forcing an action to rebuild or to repair. And so when I listen to this word, I'm just thinking, well, God's wanting us to stand our ground and to simply say, we have to force an action of growth in the area of supernatural. The new bowl simply means fresh. It means a new thing. It means it has to do with repairing. And that's the challenge. And then he says, let's put salt in this river, which he does. And then, of course, there's the declaration that simply says these waters are healed. But now if you listen to what Merle has just said, Merle's just required, she just said, actually there's going to be spiritual miracles and there's going to be physical miracles as well. Now a spiritual miracle has to be salvation. There can't be any greater miracle than getting saved, getting born again. But then not to say that there's a secondary expression of that, although it might appear to be so, but nevertheless it's still an expression of the supernatural in terms of physical healings. And so a supernatural church is going to be a church that carries with it all of the gifts that are described in the scriptures. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Let's not be tearing out that page and reading it and saying, oh, this is complicated. Why is it complicated? Because you don't believe it. Have you kind of fogged up all of that? You just allowed a mist to settle on that page and you're saying, oh, no, that was for the disciples. That's not for us. Well, hold on a minute. That's not what Mark told us. He said, these signs shall follow them that believe. Didn't say these signs shall follow them that are only exclusively disciples mentioned in the scriptures. Was it 12? Or was it the 70? Or was it the 120? Or was it the 3,000 that got saved on the day that, of Pentecost? So let's not blur the scriptures with what it is that we feel uncomfortable with. Oh, I'm not comfortable with healings. I'm not comfortable with miracles. I'm not comfortable with all of that that you find in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 where it speaks about those incredible ministry gifts. And so what I'm seeing here is that actually this is inviting us as a church to get involved with God's wanting to do in the days that we're living in. You see, it's God's promise to me, but God's promise to me is because I lead a context here that you happen to be part of, it's a context for all of us. Often I hear this thing of, you know, we need accountability in the church. Yes, we do. What do you need to hold me accountable for? What it is that God has promised me? What it is that God has asked me to become? That's where I need to be held to account. And so when I look at the congregation that we have, it's like, what is God holding us to account about to? And it's in regard to this. Be a supernatural church. Be a church that can trust me. Be a church of faith. Be a church that steps out and isn't moved by the currents of the age at the moment, which are so against the church, so against truth. Let's not be afraid of that. The devil's not stronger than God. Church will always be here. We might look a little different. The shape of us might be a little different, but the power dynamic is always intended to be resident within us. You see, that's what faith is. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. It's really believing that we need to be doing what Paul encouraged the church at Corinth to do. Paul encouraged the church, especially in this area of the prophetic. He said, cover to prophesy. To my knowledge, help me if I'm wrong, but I don't know anywhere else in the Bible where a particular gift was there for us to enjoy. The words, cover to prophesy, simply means go after it. And so why does the church need the prophetic word? Because it's so powerful and it's so needed in the time that you and I live in. Why? Because it simply lifts open, open to us the future of God's preferred future for the church. So we've got to belong first, yes, of course. And then, of course, we've got to believe. <laughs> and then according to what we believe, we eventually begin to behave and our whole you know, kind of lifestyle begins to change and get adjusted. Just, just that's the power of the gospel. But that doesn't stop there. These are not hoops that we jump through. No, this is just the, the journey that we're on. It's what we call sanctification, the progression of our Christian journey and our faith to eventually where, oh, actually all of this is so that I can become what God wants me to become. And so that's why we have prophetic release, prophetic word in the church. That's why we embrace the gift because it's in the Bible. And so God still wants the revelation of his will to be vocalized. He wants it to be sung, to be heralded. 
And so our individual futures and our corporate destiny are all actually wrapped up in the gift of prophecy. It's the only expression of ministry that we're told to covet. And you know what, some, we've received a personal word from the Lord. And so for me, as I listen to Mill's word to me, I mean, I recognize her, I embrace it. But in actual fact, I have to, there's an obligation to actually comprehend how properly to respond to God's voice to me and to the church. You kind of, most of us Christians, we don't realize that the person receiving a personal prophecy has as much responsibility to rightly respond as the prophet is in giving that word of prophecy. In fact, there are many, many biblical examples of prophecies that failed to be fulfilled because of improper response. And there Saul would be a great example. You see, personal prophecy is always conditional. And so when I give a personal prophecy, obviously I'm thinking, okay, in my humanity, God, I'm needing an unction, I'm needing an inspiration. And so when people wrote the Bible, what do we know about them? It says they were given an inspiration. They were inspired by who? The Holy Spirit. He inspired them to bring God's word. And so under that inspiration, they wrote what we have today. And that's why we look at the Bible with such respect, such regard, because the miracle that God would use humans to bring his word and his word is now unadulterated. It's accurate. And so that's why we have the responsibility as a person who moves in the prophetic is to make sure that actually I want to make sure I'm under the inspiration of God. I'm not just making this up. In fact, that there is an inspiration. There is my heart, my, my mind is stirred. To, I need to be sharing this with these individuals. But the person receiving it, for me, for example, receiving this word from Merle, I have an equal responsibility to rebase it, to, 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 to simply respond in the way that I should, right response. Because a truly inspired prophetic word actually is God's specific word to me as an individual. It's to you the same. And so none of us would doubt that actually this is the word of God, a word of God, not a word of God, the word of God. And so as I open it like this, it's the written word of God. It's the written revealed word. It's known as the logos. So in the beginning was the word, the logos, and the word was with God. Oh my, that's powerful. So for example, I can read, I can open up to the book of Psalms, for example, and I can say, oh, great. oh this is a psalm that encourages me. And so why is it that at every, not every funeral, but most funerals, we, we somehow turn to the book, uh, Psalms 23, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. <laughs> why do we do that? When in actual fact, if I really look at the context of when and why it was written, is yeah, you've got whoever wrote that psalm, let's call David, David wrote that psalm. So, so what have we got? We've really, we've got a context and he's going through moments of despair. And so he begins to pen some thoughts. Now what we do is, we take that same psalm and we put it onto our situation. That's not misinterpretation. That's simply just taking the word of God and applying it to our lives. That's why this word is so powerful. It's quick and it's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. And so when we share things with people and we read from the scriptures, from the Logos, and as we put sound to the Logos, to the words written on this page, there's something that happens. It's words that carry faith. Faith. So when we look at a prophetic word, when I look at Mill's prophetic word to myself, which I want to say is also to the church, then I have to say, I've got to begin to make sure that my heart is filled with faith. And so when we prophesy, we take the Logos and we speak it or we sing it. We couple it together with my language and the imagery that the Holy Spirit brings to my mind in that moment. And it actually becomes what is known as a rhema word. Romans 10, 17. Simply says, you know, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now, that's not logos. That's rhema. What is that rhema? Rhema simply means it's a flowing utterance. It's when we speak the word in command. And so I can meditate on the scriptures, which isn't just about reading it, but it's simply about muttering and uttering the scriptures. Because when I utter it and I put sound and I put volume to what it is that I'm reading, that's when you experience rhema. And so what am I saying? Well, when it comes to prophecy, what is required is an attitude of faith. It's imperative to the fulfilling of this prophecy that Merle has given to me. Every prophecy that I've received from people who I esteem has been recognized and carry a credential in the gifting, then I have to tell you that it's a word from God to me. It's a rhema word. 
She is taking a word from two kings and she's putting her interpretation. When I say that, it's like, oh, you're not allowed to interpret the scriptures. No, all she's doing is looking at our context, which she knows very well. She's been here for longer than I have. I've been here 20 years. When she first gave me that word, that was two decades ago. Now the word has come back to me. So I just have to say, God's trying to tell me something. I've got to make sure that I respond in faith to it and gather us as a congregation to say, God's taking us somewhere, people. Faith is imperative. What I want to do is look at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2. It says, For indeed I have had glad tidings, the gospel of God. It's proclaimed to us just as truly as they, the Israelites of old, did when the good news of deliverance from bondage came to them. But the message they heard did not benefit them. That's interesting. Why wouldn't the message, which is really good news, you're coming out of bondage, you're coming out of Egypt, why didn't that benefit them? It says, because it was not mixed with faith. When the leaning of entire personality on God is absolute trust and confidence in His power, wisdom, and goodness, it wasn't mixed with faith by those who heard it. Neither were they united in faith with the ones Joshua and Caleb who heard and did believe. So who goes into the promised land? Who enjoys the inheritance? Who comes into that place of rest? It's Joshua and Caleb and a whole brand new generation, those other 10 spies, they died in the wilderness. Their carcasses are still there, as whoever wrote the book of Hebrews describes. And so actually, you know what? <laughs> but in contrast, what we see is how Jehoshaphat responds to the prophetic word brought to him by Jehaziel. And there you go to 2 Chronicles chapter 20. And this is the, this is the thing. That they're now outnumbered, Judah, outnumbered by the enemy. And so what they're doing is they're not, they're not doing anything else other than relying on the word brought to them by a man, by a prophet. And they rose early in the morning and went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God and you shall be established. Yeah, tick that box. We believe in God. Why not? But look at this. Believe and remain steadfast to his prophets and you shall prosper. That's the difference. That's the difference. We believe in God, absolutely. But what happens when God says, you know what, I'm going to raise up Jehaziel and I'm going to tell him, I'm going to give him specific, very specific directions in terms of what it is and how Jehoshaphat needs to fight this battle. And so by mixing it with faith and also remaining steadfast to his prophets, you shall prosper. So if a prophetic word is received with an attitude of acceptance and faith, then the rhema that is heard will create faith for the fulfilling of that word. What's the next thing about how do I bring fulfillment to the prophetic word? Well, it's obedience. Obedience is imperative. And now I want to look at someone like Noah. Noah's told, listen, build an ark. And so he goes out, he builds an ark. It takes 120 years to do this. You know, there was a group in, in, in Colorado, Denver, that decided they were going to build an ark. So what is it? They get, get a thousand people breaking up into units of 300. And every day they worked on building this ark and they finished it in 11 months. It cost them 91, 91 million dollars. How's that? How scary is that? That's a lot of money. Okay. And then it also was in the pre-flood world. And of course, there was no rain in those days. The Bible just describes a mist that came up and watered the earth. And so people walk up to him for 120 years. This guy's building. What's he building? He's building an ark. Well, what's an ark? It was going to rain. Well, what's rain? They had no clue. And so can you imagine the persecution? Simply, it required obedience. It's imperative to the bringing of fulfillment of the prophetic word of a Noah. And as a result of his obedience, what happens? Him and his family get saved. You see, the proper attitude of response to personal prophecy requires obedience. It really is a cooperation with the word that allows it to have room in my life. And then I want God to experience with me obedience so that I can see that thing fulfilled. What about patience? Patience is imperative to bring in fulfillment. Scripture says it's through faith and patience that we inherit the promises of God. Remember, I preached that series on God's delays are not God's denials. You know, God's never in a hurry, but he's always on time. Maybe some of you need to hear that right now. Someone, of you, some, someone right now needs to hear that. God's never in a hurry, but he's always on time. 
And so I love the way, the way Eugene Peterson writes this in Psalm 37, verse 7 to 11. He says, quiet down before God. Be prayerful before Him. Don't bother with those who climb the ladder, who elbow their way to the top. He just says, bridle your anger, trash your wrath, cool your pipes. It only makes things worse. Don't fret. I'm not going to fret about this word that God has given to Mill. I'm not going to fret about it. I'm just going to do something about it, but I'm not going to panic. I just feel that as long as I stay in the rhythm of the Holy Spirit and the step in step with Him, we're going to see the fulfillment of people getting saved and people getting healed and you going out and enjoying levels of prosperity that are going to simply be so enjoyed. Right, he says, before long, the crooks will be bankrupt. Well, I pray for that all the time when it comes to praying for those in, in leadership. See, God investors will soon own the store. And before you know it, the wicked will have had it. You'll stare at his once famous place and there'll be nothing. Down to earth people will move in and take over, relishing a huge bonanza. You know where we need to move is move in the heavenly. So we need to start praying, get into your closet and pray and just say, God, tear down the wickedness in our nation. It's interesting how that a wrong attitude can neutralize much of what God wants to accomplish. God wants to accomplish things, so he gives us prophetic words. They've spoken over our lives, but having a wrong attitude. And many, I've heard this said, you know what, what you need to do when it comes to the prophetic, you take that word and you put it on the shelf. All the prophetic thing has to do is to confirm the word that's already in your heart. I want to say, no, that's wrong. Because simply what you are saying is that any new idea, anything else, any new thought to your life, is to be rejected, when in actual fact, that's not how it is. David had no indication that he would one day rule Israel. Elisha is a farmer. He never thought that he would be the understudy to Elijah. Paul had no idea that he would be apostle to the Gentiles. I mean, he was killing the Christians. Why would he think, oh, I know I'm gonna, I'm gonna lead this gospel, not only to the Jews, but I'm gonna take it. He didn't even think of it. There was no prophetic word. So when Ananias came to him, it was hearing things for the very first time. What we have to do is prove all the words before rejecting them. And then what about this? Waging a good warfare <laughs> is imperative to bring fulfillment to a prophetic word. Oh, why are you telling me this is hard work? Of course, well, Timothy, for example, Paul writes to Timothy. He says, I'm passing this work on to you, Timothy, my son. The prophetic word that was directed to you prepared us for this. All those prayers are coming together now, so you will do this well. Fearless in your struggle, keep a firm grip on your faith and on yourself. After all, this is a fight that we're in. See, Paul told Timothy to do more than just meditate on the prophecies. He told him more than just, you know, put it on the shelf and, you know, every now and then have a look at it. He said, no, they should be used to fight the battle. So take prophecies that are given to you by reputable prophets and wage spiritual warfare with them. David and Jehoshaphat defeated the enemies based on personal prophecies that they received from a prophet, from a man. Joshua conquered Jericho because of the following specific, he followed specific directions from the Lord for specific occasions. See, that's what warfare does. Warfare entails perseverance. It entails personal prophecy, gives us the power to per persevere. Simply, you know that when you're in a warfare, what actually do you want to take something? You've got to take it and go through to the other side. So you make sure that you actually go further than what it was. It wasn't just to come to conquer. Your enemy just runs off and they hide in the bush. You've got to make sure that you chase them. You know, if someone gave me a car so I could make a trip to Cape Town. Well, does that having the car just guarantee that I'll get to Cape Town? Well, no, it doesn't. As a driver, I've got a responsibility. I've got to make sure that I've got petrol in the tank. I've got to make sure that there's oil in the engine. I've got to make sure there's water in the radiator. I've got to do my first parade, go around the car, make sure indicators work, make sure the tires are good. You see, even if I recognize Merle's word to me, I acknowledge it's a rhema word, until such time that I do something about that word, it's never going to come to fulfillment. You see, just having the word doesn't mean guarantee that it's going to be so. So you sit here with a prophetic word on your shelf. All it's done is it's just gathered dust. And in fact, God's saying, well, actually, there's a partnership required here. Every prophetic word actually is conditional. You need to go get that prophetic word, embrace it, because it actually comes as a rhema from God.
It's taking the logos of God, the word of God, putting sound to it and applying it into your life. That's not misinterpretation. That's helping us to accomplish what it is that God has called us to. I need to make sure that my prophetic tank is always filled with a behavior. It's not works. Obedience requires works. I don't know if you thought about that. Obedience is a behavioral pattern. And so when I have to be obedient to the word of God, it means I've got to behave a certain way. That's not works. I'm not working to achieve, not at all. When God looked down at Jesus as he was baptized. He said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Jesus had done nothing. So I'm not throwing grace out the window here, not at all. I'm simply saying, actually, you know what? To get to Cape Town, there's certain things that I need to do. It's not going to happen. I could look at that car, I can walk around it, and I can say, I believe that this Cape Town will get this Cape Town. This car will get me to Cape Town. Every day I can get up in the morning, I can say, I believe that the, there's nothing wrong with my believing. There's everything wrong with my behavior until such time that I get in, put a key in the ignition and drive out the front gates and head towards the end two. I'm never going to get to Cape Town. What have you done with the prophetic words over your life? It's like baking a cake. <laughs> Are you got to have all the ingredients? You know, if you want someone to enjoy it and it's got to have a certain shape to it and a certain taste to it, well, then you've got to make sure that you're actually blending everything together with the right consistency. You put it in the oven at the right temperature for the right amount of time. Only then will you have something that has the shape and taste that others will desire and want to partake of. And so I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you, church. I'm so stirred and I thank Mill for this word that she's given to me. Nadia and I have embraced it. The elders are embracing it as well. The attitude of faith is imperative to bring fulfillment. Obedience is imperative to bring fulfillment. Patience is imperative to bring fulfillment. To wage a good warfare is imperative to bring fulfillment. I can't have an attitude that's going to neutralize all of what God has said to me and then have you not be the beneficiaries of what God has said. I've got to embrace it. And so this is an invitation. Church, can we partner together so that we can see souls saved? I'm sure you believe that God wants to populate heaven. Heaven's not just for a select elite few. Heaven's for sinners. Why do you think it took 120 years to build the ark? Well, yeah, sure, maybe there was just seven people building it plus Noah. It's because God is merciful. God gave them 120 years to repent. You read the context, the world was wicked. And God said, listen, I'm going to destroy this place. 120 years after he said that, he destroyed it. Why did he do that? Gave them 120 years to repent. Don't make God out to be horrible. God is merciful. God is compassionate. But oh my goodness, don't have a wrong attitude because a wrong attitude is going to neutralize the word of God in your life. The prophecies that God has given to you. Come on, go. Let's, let's grab them and let's do warfare. One of the things I want to encourage you is be responsible with those words. Record the word of God. Write it out. Read it. Meditate upon it. Speak it out. Pray it out. And in that way, as a church, we'll march into the future that God has for us. Come on, community. Let's do this together. I hope you see the urgency in my voice this morning as I'm encouraging us. The church needs to be strong. The church needs to be mature. The church needs to be supernatural. I can't wait for next week because I know where I'm going. And I want to invite you with me. So God bless you. Perhaps you've been listening to this and all of this is new. I want to say that God has had you dial in so that you could hear me invite you to accept Jesus Christ into your life. You know that you've been seeking. And you've been seeking for truth. You're not going to find it in the world. You're not going to find it in other religious entities and sources. You can only find it in what we describe and the Bible describes as the good news, the gospel of Jesus came and he died for you. Well, why are you saying that he died for me? Because the wages of sin is death. When Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, when they decided that they were going to disobey God and they ate of the fruit of the very tree that they were told not to, sin entered the world. And the wages of sin is death. And they lost out. The Bible says they were separated from God immediately. But ever since then, God has been working to redeem man. And that's why he sent Jesus, is to redeem you from that place. Now, you're understanding this because these words are going straight to your heart. And you know that I'm speaking to you. And so I want to encourage you right here as you're listening. You want to make Jesus Christ your Savior. You have to make him your Lord. You have to be someone who lays down your life and simply says, I repent. In other words, I'm sorry that I've sinned but you need to ask him to come into your life. So pray this with me. Say, Jesus, I ask you to come into my life. I want to be born again today. 
I want to make you the Lord and Savior. And so I surrender my life to you. I give my life to you, Jesus. That's right. Pray that prayer. Because today I want to become God's child. Amen. Well, if you pray that, congratulations. I want to encourage you. Get involved in a local church. That's the only way you're going to grow as a Christian. It's no good just praying this prayer. When in actual fact, God has so much more for you. You need to step in a place where a prophetic word can be given to you and you can see what your future in God is and where maybe you thought you didn't have a future. You have. God wants to reveal that to you. And so God bless you. For us as a congregation, we really have, you know, I think this is the, these are exciting times for the church to be alive in. And God expects us to represent him well. Remember, it's the ministry and nature of Jesus that we want him to embrace. Let's represent a Jesus that is loving, but also that is supernatural and actually operates outside of the realms of what we're experiencing in this world. But he wants us to experience joy. And so God bless you. Thanks for listening. We'll see you in the week, perhaps. Thank you.